Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Sure is great to be with you guys. Greetings from uh, your Oregon uh, brothers and sisters. It's fun to be with you guys. Um, I actually, all my peoples are from Colorado, so this is a a bit of a homecoming for me. So um, my parents actually met uh, in Fort Collins at CSU. And, uh, and I got aunts and uncles, Greeley and Sterling, got some family down in the Springs. My grandma actually lived out in Inglewood. She was always up to no good. And uh, so we've got cousins and everyone spread out. So we were the, kind of the black sheep of the family that, uh, that left and, and uh, came out this way uh, to Oregon. And coming back to Colorado, I just got to say, it's great to be here. Um, but it is dry here. It is very dry here. Um, it is uh, not that way in Oregon. We have the opposite problem. In fact, this isn't even a beard. This is just moss that has grown on my face because of how much moisture there is. But uh, my goodness, is it uh, great to see that you have sun. You guys have been hogging it. I think you should share a little more. Uh, I feel all the vitamin D just kind of, is this why we're just, I don't know if we're depressed. I just don't think we have the sun. I think that's probably the, our problem. Um, but it's really fun to be with you guys. And I just can't tell you how much I've enjoyed getting to know your, your pastor. Pastor David has just been amazing. I prayed for years that every nation would plant a church here in Colorado, here in Denver. And was so thrilled when Pastor David was the one that did it because I actually like him. So uh, it gives me a good excuse to come here and, uh, and to be with you guys. So um, you guys are really, really blessed. And we get to talk about church hurt here this morning. Um, but uh, there's not many places where I would come to talk and speak about a, a subject as heavy and as deep as that. Um, without knowing that there wasn't a great, not just pastor, but leadership in this place to be able to walk through this type of an issue uh, with people as well. So um, if this is uh, new for you, if you're new to Hope Valley, you really have found not a perfect place, but you really have found a good place. And so I'm excited for you in that. Um, but before we get uh, move forward, this is your obligatory guest speaker moment where I'm going to introduce you to my family. So these are my peoples. Uh, it's my wife there uh, next to me. And uh, my second oldest son is to uh, my right, uh, your left as you're looking at the picture. He's like 6'6 six, six now. He's a giant, and uh, it's just getting ridiculous. Um, my uh, other son there on uh, the right side of the picture is uh, our freshman in college at Oregon State University, and then Malachi is our third son. That's my daughter, Campbell, and uh, that is Yen. Yen is our uh, exchange student that's uh, living with us. He's from China, and that is the happiest he gets. That is the peak moment of his, uh, of his happiness. So, uh, yeah, we've had, for the last 12 years, we've had students from all over, from East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, from the Middle East, and from Africa, and uh, it's been a real, real fun time for us, getting to know all those different cultures and getting to share uh, Jesus and our family with them as well. Uh, So that's a little snapshot of who we be. Now, the reason, actually, where I'm out here in Colorado, other than just being with you guys, which is amazing, is uh, my wife and I are uh, having a little anniversary celebration weekend here uh, in your great state. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like Pastor Dave mentioned, uh, 22. Don't know about you, but we are definitely feeling 22. So I don't know uh, where you guys are at in your marriage journey. Last year felt like a real milestone when our marriage uh, hit 21. We could finally legally drink as a married couple. It was really great. So that was a real turning stone for us. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just we're just plowing right along. So um, I don't know if you're kind of newly married, if you got young kids here in this church. I know got a lot of young families around here. All I remember for that time is just being tired all the time, very tired. Uh, but uh, don't worry, uh, you get your some of your energy back. But then you just follow your kids to all their things. So that's uh, that's all you replace it with. Um, so here we go. All right. So church hurt is uh, what I'd like to talk about. Now this is something that was actually quite a burden for me. It was something that seemed to keep coming up over and over again, not necessarily from our church, but from people that were coming into our church, kind of really just dipping kind of one toe in the water and very hesitant with church hurt in their background, uh, knowing they love Jesus or they wanted to engage in church or they're at least curious about Jesus, but knowing the potential of being hurt again, they were very cautious about it. And it came out of a lot of conversations and a lot of times of uh, praying for people and just even ministering to people, and then noticing a few patterns as I was doing so that I thought might be helpful for our church to, to walk through. And, um, and then I'm excited that Pastor David actually asked that we would actually walk through this together uh, as well. Now, this, uh, it's a little bit heavy. There's a lot of content here, um, but I'm hoping that it is actually going to be helpful. Um, one of the things that I've just noticed about Church Hurt is that I wish, um, I wish I could just speak to it from the perspective of a victim of it, which I have been, been betrayed, lied about, been through all kinds of horrific stuff. Uh, When I took over the church 17 years ago, um, I was a relatively unsuccessful campus minister at the time, showed up to a staff meeting where the senior pastor, associate pastor, and executive pastor all quit within 15 minutes of each other. 
doctors left me. And the options were, well, do we close the church or do we give him a try? So they gave me a try. So that was, <laughs> like, you know, when you can't do any worse, you know, like, why not give the kid a shot? So that's what happened 17 years ago. And do you know what happens when everybody is really angry and hurt by the senior leadership, but then they all disappear? And then a young guy who has nothing to do with their pain shows up in their place? They take it all out on me. So I became the pinata for everybody's pain. And the stand-in, if you, if you hated your dad or your pastor or any church person ever, like, I was the guy. Just my face was the one that you just took a swing at. And uh, so I've been through that. But unfortunately, I've, uh, I've dished out a good amount of church pain as well. And um, it's hard to think of the relationships that have been broken or harmed, some that have been redeemed, but some haven't. Um, some where um, there's been forgiveness and reconciliation and some where there hasn't. It's hard to think about the words that I've said that I know that have hurt people. That, uh, you know, and words are like toothpaste, man. Once you get that stuff out of the tube, ain't no going back in, you know. Stuff you wish you could pull back, but you just can't. Ministry moments, especially in my younger years, whether I was just naive or I was ignorant or I was impatient or even just operating out of my own kind of, kind of self-centeredness. It's hard. It's hard to look back and realize, as much as I would love to just kind of be a victim and stand on the self-righteous side pointing my finger at those that caused church hurt, I know that I've caused some as well. And the truth is, not just in church, but in like all of our relational lives, hurt and pain is pretty much unavoidable. It's unavoidable if you actually want to be any degree of close with any other human being. And what I'd like to do here this morning is to like work that through a little bit to not just talk about how in pain people are, but actually work through that pain to see if there's something redemptive that God might be able to do through it. And uh, I want to do it in a way that hopefully creates the environment here in this church um, that there could be a lingering sense where a culture is built, where pain is validated, but it's also never an excuse to not grow from. Where it's actually a moment that God could take hold of in our life to actually produce a deeper level of growth, a deeper level of healthier relationship. Because the whole point, the whole point of our existence is to be able to learn how to relate the way God does. To be able to love God and one another the way that he loves us. That is the whole point. The whole point of a church is learning how to develop a culture, a healthy relational culture that knows how to love one another well. That's the whole point. It's not just about having nice buildings or good programs or creative graphics. It's not about any of those features. It's not about success or for you how much money that you make or how far you advance in your career field or like, it's not about any of that. At the end of the day, it will be the degree to which you are able to relate well to God and others. That is the thing that will last not just for now, but into eternity. And if we could not allow our pain to stop us from pursuing Jesus toward that uh, trajectory. I think really beautiful things could happen, not the least of which is what Jesus prayed that his church would be, would that we would be known by the love that we have for one another. We would actually be a display for people to see the way in which God loves us by the way in which we love one another. That, to me, would be so, so compelling. But it is undeniable how much church hurt gets in the way of that. There's just a few statistics I want to throw past you guys. As I was doing this, I tried to look up some like lectures and podcasts on church hurt, and I didn't find episodes on church hurt. I found entire podcasts dedicated to church hurt. Um, somebody start praying for those people. Uh, I don't know how you do that all the time. But there's just so much out there. One study showed that up to 37% of people have some significant amount of church hurt from their past that is keeping them from reengaging church altogether. Those same studies found that among Christians that are engaged in church on some level, over 80% of them have at least enough church hurt in their lives that they're not engaging as fully as they know that they would want to or are supposed to. Meaning that I love Jesus and I know Jesus wants me to be a part of church, but maybe they only go every once, every four to six weeks or they skip small groups or they come late and leave early. They do everything they can to just stay as like right on the safe sort of like side of church, right on the outside kind of of it, uh, enough into it to not feel it too much guilt, but it's just too much pain to dive more fully into it. It's a real thing. I don't know how many of you guys have been paying attention over the last few years on social media, but there's just so many notable pastors and church leaders that have done some incredibly horrible things and fallen and sin and moral failures and adultery and you name it. 
Some of them were incredibly painful to me, either because I had learned a lot or benefited from them and considered them to be almost spiritual heroes of mine. Um, others that I didn't know personally, but through second or third hand that I do. And knowing the fallout and just how many people were hurt, how many people just even questioned the goodness of God from it. It's just absolutely painful. And I don't know that there is more church hurt going around. In fact, I don't believe that there actually is. But certainly our digital age is like putting it on a megaphone into all of our ears on a consistent basis. And one of the hard parts is there's tons of great men and women of God following and serving Jesus, faithfully doing it all the way to the end. They're just boring and they never get attention. Uh, One of the scariest things I found, this was a study, a denominational study done of pastors, found that when this, within this certain denomination, that up to 30% of them were found to be on the narcissistic personality disorder spectrum. Now, I got good news and bad news about that study. The good news was it was a Canadian denomination. The bad news is we have to be way worse in America. I was just in Canada two weeks ago, man. Those people are so nice. So nice. If they're narcissists, man, do they hide it well. <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, you can imagine when leadership is trending in that direction, just how much pain is going to come as a result of it. And you can think of, even from a pastoral perspective, the pressures that there are to like, go into an, an urban area and to bring the gospel into a place that may not necessarily be receptive to it and to try to do something that is balanced in the way that it loves one another and also on mission together at the same time while paying all your bills and supporting all your leaders and loving your family well. Like, there's a lot of pressures that come along with that. Like, How many of you have the quality of your marriage and parenting baked into your job description at work? I do. And so the pressure to build a church, and maybe you overwork in that direction, maybe you neglect a little bit your family. Your family falls apart, but that's connected to your work, so you can get family if you're actually a jerk at home. And so you just realize how the back and forth can go really, really quickly, and people start to become objects to be used rather than children of God that you're actually serving. You can see how that pressure would mount and where church hurt would come into that system very, very easily. But maybe like... The more encouraging news comes out of 2 Corinthians, where if we look at this passage, I just want to show you this briefly, but this is is 2 Corinthians, but it's actually like 3rd, 4th, or 5th Corinthians. There were multiple letters that were written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. We just have two in our New Testament. If you have any of the other copies, holla at your boy, love to see him. Um, Don't be stingy. Um, But there was a back and forth communication between, like, this leader and this church because there was so much church hurt. I mean, you had guys that were sleeping with stepmoms. You had Christians that were taking each other to court uh, constantly and continually trying to swindle one another. You had tribalism and division, people picking their favorite leaders and treating them as celebrities in their midst that they were all fawning after and then seeing who had the better celebrity pastor that they were really into. Like you had all the worst of the worst going on. Whatever was happening, whether it was sexually or morally in culture in a depraved sense, was happening right there in the midst of that church. So Paul had a very strained relationship here. They were constantly accusing him of being ill legitimate in his authority because he was suffering and he was weak and rejected so often it didn't even look like he was good at his job most of the time. And so he's writing these letters back and forth and you'll pick up the tone even as you read this of just how much tension and church hurt there's baked into this interaction. He says, this will be my third visit to you. And he says, every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while I'm absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sent earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is actually speaking through me. Next slide. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I might not have to be so harsh in my use of authority. The authority, listen, the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. You see the line that he has to walk? Like, they've dished out so much accusation and and just slanderous comments and all kinds of backbiting towards him, accusing. And you notice how he doesn't just say, well, dude, I'm an apostle, so you better recognize. You better back off. But even when he pulls the authority card, he makes it very, very clear. My authority given by God is to build you up and to not tear you down. But does all spiritual authority behave that way? 
In fact, most church hurt is the reversal of that dynamic where spiritual authority just tears down rather than actually builds up. It's a powerful thing when you actually see men and women walk in humility with one another in spite of all the friction and conflict. But in our modern world, it seems to become increasingly rare. So what I'd like to do is just introduce a few questions that I found to be personally really helpful, both on my own journey and even as I've been helping to walk others through theirs as well. I'm a little bit of a nerd, both on the theological and the psychological side of things. As Pastor David said, um, that was like my, my doctoral thesis was on the integration of psychology and theology and the wisdom that psychology might have, but the truth that's fundamentally found in the scriptures, because there's nothing that is wiser than the Bible about helping us know how to do relationships in a very messy context. There's nothing like it. Um, and there's a few questions that I found to be really helpful especially as we process through church hurt in our lives and the lives of people that matter to us or possibly in conversations where we're ministering to others who are going through it as well. So here's the first one. The first idea is who hurt you? This is a really important question to ask. Who hurt you? Now, you could see how easily this is going to apply to something much more broadly than just church hurt. This applies to any meaningful relationships, including our families and families of origin. The question is who hurt you? When people say the word church hurt, it gets under my skin a little bit. Because when people say, I was just really hurt by the church, I'm like, nah, there's like three billion of us. Really? Really? The question is who? Not that your pain is invalid or that you haven't been hurt, but who was it actually? Like what was it? Give me the name or the names. But one of the things that pain does when we're experiencing it is pain has one goal, and that's alleviation. Pain doesn't care about truth. Pain doesn't care about reality. Pain doesn't care about health. Pain doesn't care about growth. Pain cares about stopping. And when you're in pain, when you like feel, experience pain within a church community, pain wants to say, man, this is a church hurt. So that you can describe like a large bubble around yourself, a protective bubble, so that if it's the church that hurt me, now I can categorize every possibility of a person inside the church as a possible person that might hurt me, allowing me to be less vulnerable to them and to be more self-protected when I'm among them. But if you name them, now, not only are you going to be still vulnerable to some of the church, but vulnerability goes two ways. Yeah, sometimes it hurts, but oftentimes it heals. And the very community that God may have called you to might be the ones that he's actually one to use to heal you. But if you categorize them all in one giant lump, you're missing it. Now, if you're like with a good therapist or counselor, like they'll help you do this as well. Who hurt you? Who actually hurt you? This isn't to blame you for the pain or invalidate your pain. It's just that let's, let's actually get as factual and accurate as we can with it. Then we can use all of the Bible's resources to help us with it. Second question is this. Were you hurt or were you harmed? Now, if any of you guys have an athletic background, I played football at uh, Oregon State University, not the University of Oregon. We hate them very much, very much so with a passion. Uh, we are the blue-collar younger brother <laughs> that is always resentful of them. Uh, but in my, all of my athletic days, it was drilled into my brain, this uh, question of were you hurt or were you injured? Are you hurt or are you injured? And then we kind of resented the question for a little while because I don't know what the difference is supposed to be. But then once you got to be an upperclassman and look at some of the younger like kids coming up, you realize really quickly because every day at practice they were dragging in like, oh, coach, I don't think I can go today. I just, I don't think I can go today. And they make a miraculous comeback for the games like all the time. But you know, to practice, like I can't, just, I can't just go. And then you realize really quickly that no, 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 champ, you're not injured. You're just hurt. Uh, you need to get in the cold tub and tape an anvil to it like the rest of us and just learn how to be a little tougher and resilient. That's, that's the thing. Now, if you are legitimately injured, then it's dumb. To play on that, you're only going to make it worse, which is why the question is so important going both directions. Are you hurt or are you harmed? Look, pain is pain. And here's the deal. The worst you've ever been hurt in a relationship is the worst you've ever been hurt in a relationship. There's people that have gone through traumatic and extreme levels of abuse, but that's not everybody. And just because those people exist, it's never fair to just to compare yourselves to them. Yeah. So your pain matters. 
God cares about your pain. God knows pain, even absorbed even your pain when he was on the cross. I deeply believe that. But asking this question, just being curious about this question, is what releases us into a whole world of God's presence and his wisdom. Am I hurt or am I harmed? And asking these questions are so important. One of the phrases I use on repeat as often as I possibly can around my church, that one of the best benefits of Christianity is the promise that for all those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. None. No condemnation. For all the hurt that I've caused, for all the hurt that has been caused to me, there's no amount of pain in me or that I put out there that I have any level of condemnation for or I should have any fear of diving down into. And if this is true, if this is true, God has not given me a spirit of fear and there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You know what it liberates me to do? Be curious. I don't believe in condemnation for those who are in Christ. I believe in curiosity. Curiosity is the very thing God introduced in Genesis chapter 3 after the original sin of humanity. What's the first response? He asked questions. Where are you? Does the same thing with Cain in the next chapter over. Why is your face so downcast? Where's your brother? Curiosity. Condemnation is what keeps us from curiosity. But curiosity is not about blaming yourself. It's not about victim blaming. It's not about invalidating your experience or what you've gone through. It's about asking deeper questions to get at the heart of what's really going on. And once you do that, you start to ask questions like, well, where was I hurt or was I harmed? Did someone say something rude or offensive? Did they do it with ill intent? Was it actually rude or offensive? Or is possibly this just an area of extra sensitivity for me that it rubbed me the wrong way? And these are just helpful questions to ask without preformed conclusions that have to come along with them. But there's different responses to the differences here. When we treat all hurt as harm, we have very limited responses. It's either like fight them or run away from them. But if it's hurt, the Bible has a whole range of wisdom it offers to us. Not just forgiveness, but even like overlooking an offense. Not everything has to be addressed. Not every conversation has to happen. If you've been married for longer than like an hour or two, you learn this pretty quick. You pick your battles. You choose the ones that will help build your marriage the most. Not every time you just happen to be annoyed. And this is true even in church. But there's a difference. Even for those in church, the church can at times attract a type of person that the opposite is true. They're walking around as if they're just hurt. Maybe it's even partly their fault that they are when it's actually harm. And they're doing this under the guise of somehow this is being merciful or loving, but it's actually the opposite. Allowing someone to harm you and potentially like not saying anything and that harm continuing on to others is not a loving thing at all to that person. In the extreme situations of abuse, if there is abuse happening and no one calls the cops, that is unloving. Not just to the victims, but even to the perpetrator. Because it is not good for them to abuse. Are you with me on this? Please say yes. This is such an important question to ask. Were you hurt or were you harmed? This isn't to condemn you. This is certainly not to invalidate you. But it is to draw out nuance. And pain does not like nuance. There's pain and there's pleasure. But there's a difference in between. And one of the reasons why this question is important, I know not everyone's going to love what I'm about to say, but I've read a lot of books, done a lot of studies, and had a lot of pastoral experience. Here's what's becoming more and more true in our culture. That there were times, and there still are, where the idea where might equals right, where those in power, what they say and what they do are automatically justified simply by their privilege or position. And we know that's obviously wrong. But you know what's also wrong? The idea that your pain automatically makes you right. And there's becoming an incentivization towards victimhood in our culture where it actually gains you more attention, more audience. It actually gives you higher positions, higher influence. All that's true. But just like might doesn't make right, being a victim isn't a virtue. One of the beautiful things about Christianity is that Jesus is the truth. And so he transcends my power, he transcends my pain, and he exists on a level that can't be tainted by my bias. 
And if that truth exists externally from me in one who is perfect, what it means is I get to ask these questions rather than leverage my pain to try to control other people and limit my pain in the future. One of the reasons why I just love the idea of even victimhood in my own life is it alleviates me from paying attention to God's call on my life and how I respond. Because there's what's done to me and there's how I respond to it. And you, one of the things God wants to restore to you is your response ability, your ability to respond. Not to take responsibility for what wrong things other people have done, but to begin to actively choose, well, what am I going to do about this? Look, trauma specialists tell this like over and over and over again. It doesn't get caught up in our mental health pop culture, but this is the stuff that's actually true. Trauma, acute trauma that happens, a significant life-changing event that disturbs your well-being in a major way. Trauma is just an acute event. That's all it is. The lingering trauma is our response to it. This is why when you go to trauma specialists, they'll have to deal with the event that happened and help you process through it and deal with it. And sometimes this can take a very, very long time. In the church world, this can be an incredibly patient process, depending on the severity of the trauma. But what lingers in our life are the ways we've responded to it. When you're hurt, it's just easy to say, I'll never trust a man again. Or all women are like this. Or it's just easy to recoil and say, man, I will never, ever give myself away in a relationship like that ever again. Or all authority must be automatically, like, you must be suspicious of it. Okay, these are responses that don't exactly lead us to the abundant life that Jesus promises us. And we can use our pain as our, like, nope, you can't, you can't challenge me on the fact that I am a jerk, that I am closed, that I am hard, that I am rude, that I am, like, overly angry, and that's spilling over to all kinds of other people hurting them unintentionally. But you can't call me out because of my pain. It's like, well, good families do. Your pain is valid, and we care about that. But you know what? Just because you're in pain does not mean you're allowed to cause it. Were you hurt or were you harmed? And this is going to help unlock your ability to say like, okay, are there unhealthy ways that I have responded to this? And lastly, and here's where all the action is, all of the action, which kind of bleeds into the last question a little bit. Was the hurt you experienced, was it initiated or was it aggravated? Most of the time, the relational pain we feel was an aggravation, meaning it was a pre-existing bruise or wound and someone just rubbed up against it. I came to church one time, a um, long time ago, back when I was in college. Saw a buddy of mine in church and went to give him a high five. And when I did, he just screamed in pain, almost started crying. It was so bad. I said, Whoa, what's the problem? He said, oh, man, I just, I just tore my shoulder yesterday. I said, well, then why did you give me the high five? Said, it's just, it was just instinct, you know? I just did it. Now, here's the question. Did I cause his pain or aggravate it? Did I hurt his shoulder or was his shoulder already hurt and I aggravated it? Big difference, yeah? Huge difference. Most of our deepest relational pain came very, very early on in our childhood. And most of the relational patterns we've experienced as broken happens in our earliest experiences, that by the time we meaningfully get connected into church, especially as young adults or adults, man, the wounds are already there. That does not mean that someone didn't aggravate it. It does not mean your pain isn't valid. It doesn't even mean that they didn't sin against you or do something wrong. But sometimes the extent to which you're feeling pain isn't necessarily in proportion to what was done. And that's not to say that, like, that's a character flaw of you. It's to point out the obvious fact that maybe there was a deeper pain underneath it all along. And asking this question has nothing to do with blaming you for your pain. But it allows you to be curious about your pain because you're not afraid of your pain. And once you're curious about it, you can begin to notice patterns. And my friends, patterns are where the action is. Because if you can find a pattern, you can change. 
You can take responsibility. You can grow. You can't control the world and everyone else and just bubble wrap everything so that it never hurts you again, but you can actually grow into a wiser and like better version of humanity that Jesus is calling you to be to be able to navigate this world in a more like, like adult and mature way. It's a beautiful thing that God might want to do. He doesn't delight in your pain, but I promise you he will not waste it. And the real difficulty of our pain is we validate it, but oh, do we never let it sit on the throne. It's dangerous when it does that. Your pain is valid, but it can never be Lord. Was this initiated or was this aggravated? How many of you have friends? Don't raise your hands. Uh, No, friends. How many of you have a friend? They have just been in the series of bad dating relationships before. And they like date the same person bad person, it seems like, over and over. You ever seen this before? Uh, it's kind of comical if it wasn't so sad. Um, but why is that? I mean, I know people literally, that in, like 90% of the relationships they've ever had, they've been cheated on. And like, okay, is it their fault they're being cheated on? No. But is this a pattern? Uh-huh. Do we have a filter system that maybe is a little broken? Are we accepting maybe a type of person that we shouldn't? And if there wasn't a significant level of pain or maybe rejection of our past, maybe a total feeling of being unworthy of love and absence of the experience of the love of God in our life, maybe we wouldn't have to grab so quickly to the guy that just hits on you at the bar. And maybe we're just dealing far too downstream when we're talking about, I can't believe another one cheated. This is just how all men are. No, that's not how all men are. But maybe part of your pain has filtered some of the good ones out unintentionally. Oh, there's so much helpfulness when you ask these questions and you walk them through with like a trusted friend or pastor or small group leader. Like, we don't believe in condemnation. And the Spirit of God will help us move into these places with incredible compassion and gentleness and care, knowing that they can be very, very sensitive. But he absolutely desires to bring freedom. And don't for a second doubt that. That's what he desires for us. Was this initiated or was this aggravated? And once we can find those patterns, oh my goodness, we have an opportunity to grow. In the way in which God desires for us to grow, and here's, here's the hardest thing I have to say. The way in which God desires us to grow from relational pain is in relationship. Yeah, it's true. I, uh, <clears throat> okay, my childhood from the outside looked pretty nice. Literal white picket fence in front of our house. But there was enough abuse and harm from my background that was so painful for me. And my pain had one constant message it delivered to me. People hurt. The people that are supposed to care for you most hurt the most. That's what pain told me. And so I, uh, I, you could say, well, Seth's just an introvert. No, Seth just learned that when he went to his room and played with his Legos and just went into his fantasy world and like was doing drawings and books and just kind of lived inside his own mind, that's where Seth was safe. And then what ended up happening when I came into church was it was so uncomfortable. Like I didn't want to sit near anybody. I didn't want to be near anybody. I remember having like my pastors come to me and say like, Seth, like you don't hang out with us very much like outside of church. I'm like, Yeah. Trust me, it's for all of our better interest. And then it turns out, like, it's the very people I was afraid to connect with that became the very people through which I found healing. My best friend in the whole world (laughs) mirrors my father by occupation, by his intelligence, by his giftings and his talent, and yet his temperament is entirely 180 degrees different. I spent a lot of years being afraid to ever be close to him because of all the similarities that he had. But it's actually when I did get closer to him, God started redeeming all that pain in my life and realizing that just because I was hurt in the past by someone in this category did not mean that all in that category were automatically going to be hurtful. And I found spiritual family in the place where my life was totally void of natural family. I found spiritual fathers that, again, I was terrified of and very suspicious of, but actually loved me really, really well. 
Tim Fletcher is a Canadian uh, therapist that works with addiction counseling. He is one of, the, one of the best out there. He's a very, very high success rate. And what he says is that if you just use <coughs> psychology alone, like recovery statistics are just depressing. Like don't look at them. They're really, really bad. But he says if you include a surrogate relational system, addiction recovery goes up remarkably, meaning you have to give people, show people, demonstrate for people what healthy family or relationship is supposed to look like so that relationships can replace the drug. You can be connected healthily to people instead of the substance. But when you don't have a frame for what that's even supposed to look like, you can't just imagine it for yourself. And so he just brings these communities around these addicts, and it's through that process that he's able to help them recover. Virginia Satter was another brilliant and amazing um, psychotherapist in the 70s and uh, 60s. And she talked about the idea of how everyone doesn't, everyone doesn't get out of their families unbroken. Everyone's broken in their early families somehow to some degree. But here's the beautiful thing she says. Families don't have to be perfect. She says they only have to be good enough. <laughs> this should encourage you and parents out there. And by good enough, she just means, look, look, look. You're going to fail them. You're going to hurt them. It's not going to go great all the time. But family is supposed to point us to something bigger than just family. There is a heavenly family to which we were all made to experience love from. And even when, even when an imperfect church family is good enough, meaning it's led by qualified men and women that love sincerely and humbly, though totally imperfectly, there's something beautiful that can happen. Even the moments where sin happens or harm or hurt, even when those things come place and they're handled with healthily, that can even point us even more so to God's kingdom and what it's meant to look like. Make us hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, not just settle for what we experience here. But in order to do that and experience that kind of community, it's going to require on all of our parts growth, relational growth, which is the thing that I promise you, as frustrating as your diet is, it's easier than this. It's the thing all of us are using our hobbies and our career and our dating apps to avoid because it is that scary and difficult. But this is why we follow Jesus, not just because he just gives us good advice to follow, because he promises to live inside us and give us power to live differently. This is what Jesus wants to do. This is his agenda. He wants to grow you up in learning how to love and receive love better. And here is a process of what love and growing in love actually looks like. Now, you could apply this to your careers, to your families, to all your relationships, but once you see this, you can't unsee this. But I just wanna walk this through before we close. <clears throat> the four stages of relational growth. The first is excitement. So you come to a church, you go on a first date, the first thing you notice is everything that is awesome and you don't notice all the weaknesses. Like they're looking their best, you're looking your best, they're laughing at all your jokes, you're at an expensive meal, like you're doing fun things together, everything's great. You come to a church, the songs sound great, the sermons sound fine, the people look fun, and everything seems okay. Excitement is a normal first stage of a relationship. In fact, if there is no excitement in the first stage of a relationship, that's probably not a great sign. But that's not where relationships stay. The second stage is disappointment, where inevitably the oxytocin and dopamine hit that you got from that excitement stage wears off. Now you start seeing their weaknesses, and now you stop seeing their strengths, and now you start wondering if this relationship was ever good in the first place. And what most people do with relationships, if they just go so hard into the dopamine release, they do extravagant dates and expensive meals and even consummate it through having sex outside of marriage. All this just releases massive amounts of hormones in us. And all of a sudden, when that crashes, we start thinking to ourselves like, well, maybe this person wasn't my person or maybe this was never even real. Or possibly, you cross boundaries that God put in place so that you wouldn't just be bonded to an experience, you learn how to be connected to a person. And when you hit disappointment, this is your opportunity to adjust your expectations. Do I need them to be perfect for me to be okay? Have I subtly shifted, like, like using them for my own pleasure rather than serving them for their own well-being? And once you go through disappointment and you go into adjustment and find places where you can repent and learn to receive an imperfect person in your life and learn to be vulnerable and have yourself received as an imperfect person, this is when growth starts to happen. But you know what most people want to do? They hit excitement, they hit disappointment, and they say, well, I'm going back to excitement. 
I need a new job. I need a new city. I need a new church. I'm not getting fed anymore. I don't feel really connected here. I don't really know my place. I don't know if my gifts are really being used all that well. And so you switch, and there's good reasons to leave churches, okay? But when many people switch, they're going, and they feel like, man, I feel like alive again. I'm hearing the scripture in a fresh way. I'm like, this is a fresh community. It feels really authentic. But they say that they're growing, but they're not. They're just excited again. And just give it a few years, and they'll hit disappointment, and then go right back through the same cycle. Wash, rinse, repeat. It's the same thing that we're getting on our dating apps. Excitement, excitement, excitement. You're in it long enough, you hit disappointment, and it must not be the right one. That's, that's not how it works. But we grow through the disappointment into adjustment and realize how selfish we are. Realize our unrealistic expectations. Realizing how we've sinned and violated God's commands and how to do relationships in the first place. And then we grow. But this is so not easy because relationships are so hardwired into you. And the way you do relationships, the way you avoid conflict, the way you people please, the way you like, come out, like claws out anytime someone is mildly rude to you, like all of these are deeply ingrained responses to pain from your life. Changing them requires Oh, a deep level of faith in Jesus, and it takes time. There is no microwave, and no matter how good of a sermon that me or Pastor David ever preaches, it will never be enough. It takes time. Let me show you this next slide. This will be a last one. So this is a reverse bike. It looks pretty normal from this picture, but if you see the next one, here's the handlebars. You'll notice that the handlebars are turned left while the wheel goes right. So this was designed as a psychological experiment to measure human change. Because you know the old adage, you never forget to ride a bike? You learn as a kid and you never forget it, even if you've never ridden for years, because it literally gets locked into your neurons. It gets locked into your brain. So do relationships. So do relational styles. And what they found was just adjusting one thing, just one thing in how to ride a bike meant no one could ride this bike. There's videos you can find online with a guy that designed it, stands on a stage, stands 15 feet apart from someone on the bike and says, I'll give you $200 if you can ride from there to me. No one can do it. And what they found, it took 6 to 12 months to ride this bike well. You just think, it's just one adjustment. There's, one little, there's pedals, there's balance, it's just steering. It's just one little adjustment. No, it throws off everything. You know what happens when you come to Jesus? It throws off everything. All your instincts. It challenges them. You've been told your whole life, trust your gut, follow your heart, just be you. And then you come to Jesus, he says, die to yourself, follow me backwards you've lived your whole life live your best life now just thrive and like have the most fun and as Jesus says yep die to live it's backwards take vengeance hold them accountable and Jesus says mm, forgive as you've been forgiven like they're just all backwards and rather than just people pleasing how often did Jesus people please like zero times none when did he ever cush up to people to get a little clout like never it's all backwards for us. It's all backwards. And did the disciples run away from Jesus because of Judas? No. Learning how to follow Jesus is like riding a reverse bike. Only the bike you have been riding is the real reverse one. Now you're learning to actually live the life that you've been called to. It's why marriage is so hard. It's why church is so hard. It's why intimate relationships are so hard. It's why your close work relationships are so hard. If you're a manager, it's why that's so freaking hard. Yeah? It's hard. But this is the thing. You were made by a God who is love, in love, for love, and there's no other purpose of your life that will satiate you other than learning how to love well with wisdom, knowing when to correct and rebuke, knowing when to be kind and forgive and overlook offense, like knowing when to encourage and build up and when to challenge, like all these things, knowing when to step into conflict and maybe knowing when you need to step away from it, knowing when something is harmful or abusive or knowing when the issue is actually more with me. I've just got a deep wound and you unintentionally triggered it. Like knowing all these things, becoming self-aware of these things is what helps us to start the journey of loving God better. And God is so invested in this. He's so invested in this. You can avoid it. You can be a really good Christian and just know lots of Bible and theology. I know them. I've been around the academy enough that there's enough people so intent on avoiding their pain and issues. Oh, they just learn lots of theology. And they're right about everything. And 
wrong about everything. That's why Jesus said the Pharisees, like you have to have a righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees. They knew everything. They memorized their Bibles for crying out loud. But they didn't know how to love well. But by the grace of God, Jesus died showing you what perfect love is, decided to come and live inside of you when you give your life to him so that he could show you a better way to love your wife like Christ loves the church. To be able to love your kids, respect your husband, be an amazing employee, and to be an incredible leader. Jesus died to help show you this way. And whatever success comes along the way, fantastic. But this is the thing. This is what you take with you. This is what matters. This is what you look back on, either with regret or joy. This is the thing. Please don't let your pain become Lord. Oh, it matters so much to God. But don't let it trick you. Don't let it lie to you. And don't let it keep you from the very people that God might want to use to heal you.